So our first speaker this morning is Jeff Schmidt, and Jeff is the bituminous field engineer. He's been in the Office of Construction and Materials at the Iowa Department of Transportation. So we'll please welcome Jeff. Thank you, Renee. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, kind of an overview of the inspection process. The inspection process is one of the most important processes in a highway project. Uh, the quality of the finished product generally reflects the quality of the inspection. I think you can see that on some, uh, some projects. And as Wes alluded to it, it's a, a collaboration or a partnership with the contractor with many common goals and objectives. In the most basic sense, it's quality work meeting the plans and specifications, completing the work on time and within budget. And I was thinking about what are some of the, the traits of a good inspector, and I know everybody can probably come up with their own list, but I think that the inspector should be respectful, honest, and fair, perform his duties with firmness, but in good nature, work cooperatively with fellow employees, the supervisors and the contractors, be detail oriented, but see the big picture and don't get bogged down by some of the details if it doesn't really affect the overall quality of the work. Uh, be organized and efficient in doing their job because asphalt paving is a, a it's, it's rolling down the road, uh, it's a moving target, and there's a lot of, uh, of uh, coordination that needs to be done with the uh, inspectors and the contractor and so it's it's kind of a uh, a fast moving process in a way uh, they need to be safety conscious and that's certainly listed last but not least in the list communication it's critical for project success uh, you need to establish the line of communication with the the contractor's uh, superintendent or whoever's in charge of the project to open, have an open line of communication and preferably uh, kind of lay down the ground rules and, and uh, how it's going to be accomplished at the pre-con. Uh, some of the things that are important to why communication is important, uh, if there's setting the work schedule, if there's any changes in the work schedule, there's so much coordination involved with, with other offices and, uh, and suppliers and everything. So it's, it's important that the work schedule uh, be discussed and nearly every day what's gonna happen the next day. Uh, potential problems, uh, whether it's something related to the, the contractor discovers or the inspector need to be talked about and how it can be addressed. Uh, of course, specification violations or failing test results, uh, those can be pretty serious and, and uh, involve a rejection of material, <coughs> excuse me, or uh, rework. So you need to get this um, notification as soon as possible to limit the amount of defective material that's placed or minimize the rework. Some of the responsibilities for inspection Plan familiarity. You need to be get the contract documents, be well versed in the the requirements, be able to speak and answer questions about the contract documents if you're asked, and certainly you need to be able to find the answer, know where to find the answer uh, to the question that's asked. Uh, recognize when the work conforms or does not conform with the contract requirements. Work done without inspection. Uh, in today's, uh, the reality today is that we have a lot less inspectors out on projects than what we used to. And so we need to make sure that we're in the right place at the right time. And that's through communication with the contractor, knowing what, what uh, work is going to be done, anticipate when these situations may arise, and then work, uh, have a working relationship with the contractor that allows for being in the right place at the right time. 
contract compliance. Ensure that the materials furnished and the work performed are in compliance with the contract requirements and that appropriate tests and measurements are made to determine the, the progress and quality of the work. Recognize when work is unacceptable and report it to the contractor before it becomes an expensive and time-consuming fix. As far as testing, ensure proper sampling and testing procedures are used. Notify the contractor of any failures or rejection of materials uh, before it's incorporated into the work. Maintain a daily diary or inspector's daily report, the IDR. And that's an accurate record of the day's happenings. It includes contractor's activities, instructions given to the contractor, any agreements made or, or uh, issues that, uh, that have ari arisen. <clears throat> it may have legal importance in that in the case of a claim or a, or a, a lawsuit potentially, you may need to recreate events and sequence of operations. So it's, uh, it's important to have a, a daily log of what's going on to kind of put together the, the sequence of events. Some of the things that inspectors should include in the daily diary or IDR, the controlling operation, and that's the item that's on the critical path if that type of scheduling system is used, mostly for bigger projects. But that's important in that if an if a item of work is on the uh, critical path, any delays in that item cause delays in completion of the project. Always keep track of the weather conditions. That's important if, uh, in order to determine if a working day should be assessed. Any primes or subcontractors on site and what their activities are, what they are doing. Material sampling and testing that's done, uh, any certifications that are received for materials, um, safety issues, that's an important thing, whether it involves traffic control, equipment, or operations. Traffic control is a, is a contractor, a quality control item, but if you see a, an issue with traffic control, you need to talk with the uh, superintendent, make sure it gets taken care of. Any non-compliances, whether they're discussed or actually issued, need to be uh, documented. And then sometimes if there's an issue with the, with the uh, operation, a photo or videos are good to document and better show, illustrate the, the issue that's taking place. An inspector has a certain levels of authority they can reject material or suspend work if the quality is in dispute. Uh, generally, you'd want to inform the contractor immediately and your supervisor and explain the situation. And typically, the final decision will come from the project engineer. The inspector's authority does not extend to modification of the contract documents. That is done uh, by the project engineer. Uh, approval or acceptance of the work that's also done by the project engineer and then supervising contractors operations the prime contract for the contractor is is uh, responsible for uh, for supervising their uh, operations as well as the prime if the prime is not uh, does not provide that supervision a little bit about some of the contract documents you should be familiar with and just kind of a review of, in, in case uh, you're not aware of, of, of all of them and how they work together. This is kind of an old uh, proposal form. It, uh, it contains <coughs> some information that's important. Uh, this project or proposal has actually has three projects tied together. Um, it, has, uh, it has the bid items and the quantities, the design quantities, and that is what uh, the contractor prepares his bid on. <clears throat> they also have some provisions, which includes the, uh, the different specifications that are involved or covered by this 
proposal and some other uh, notes. Uh, it may have to do with DBE requirements and, and other things. Once the proposal is, is uh, submit, the bid is submitted and awarded, the contract is signed between the, the contractor and the contracting authority. And basically that's an agreement that the contractor will do the work uh, as specified and the uh, contracting authority will pay the amount uh, of the bid. <clears throat> Addendums. Those are last minute changes to the contract document, typically in the last three weeks or so before the letting. And basically there are uh, changes in the specification requirements, clarifications, oftentimes they're a uh, change in the uh, bid quantities um, that are discovered late in the review process. And they may include a plan changes and have actually have uh, plan sheets attached and those become part of the contract documents. <clears throat> it's typically the last change that's made to the contract documents before the contract is awarded. After the contract's awarded, then it becomes a changes are by contract modification. Project plans. It's important to the inspector to, to review the contractors uh, or the project plans, preferably, and I don't know how many actually get the plans ahead of, or, um, before they're turned in, but I think it's important that inspectors have input into the, the, uh, the design if they see something that that's, uh, doesn't look right or a quantity that they see is, is in error. <clears throat> There's a lot of information. There's uh, tabs and typicals that show the quantities. There's estimate reference information that basically shows um, where the, the quantities were, were arrived at. And it's important that this is, is correct. Standard road plans, those are, uh, as the name suggests, they're standard. They don't change very often. Uh, they're referenced in the plans by the number and date. And they become part of the plan set, but they're not a sheet in the plans per se. And the standard specifications, <clears throat> those are the, the base specs that uh, there are uh, about five years usually between issues of the standard specifications. Those, uh, um, so they, they are revised periodically and the revisions are in the general supplemental specifications and those come out every six months, typically in April and October. <clears throat> Supplemental specifications, those are uh, changes to the standard specifications that involve a particular way of doing something, a different way that's uh, being considered. They generally are a, a specification on a certain type of project, say uh, an asphalt project uh, on a primary road or something like that, so there's criteria where it's applied automatically to the projects. And uh, it's kind of a trial period when they're using these supplemental specifications. And then over time, when they're fine-tuned and it's people, uh, people feel they're ready, they can become part of the standard specifications. <clears throat> Developmental specifications are trial specifications, something new that's put into specific projects. Uh, it's kind of a controlled way of, of having pilots or trial projects in that they can try it. There's a controller that kind of uh, is a, the controller of that spec and they uh, determine who can 
which projects can have that specification, and then they monitor the results. It can be uh, make adjustments or tweaks to the specification much easier than if it's every six months. So they can kind of fine tune the specification, include it on additional projects, and then um, it become uh, probably a supplemental specification after it's, uh, after it's been determined that, uh, that it's gonna work out okay. Special provisions are specific projects they're included on specific projects. So they're kind of a one-off specification uh, attached to the project. It even says the project number right on the front of the special provision. So it's something unique that they wanna try on a project, a unique requirement. And so then they've, uh, <clears throat> um, it's, it may or may not become more widespread but it's, uh, it's something unique and it's project specific. Materials IMs, these involve test methods, uh, acceptance, um, acceptance of materials, uh, testing procedures, sampling requirements. Uh, it's all related to uh, materials that are used in the projects. So with all these specifications and different types of contract documents, there's bound to be some uh, conflict between them. And in fact, it's, that's the nature of them because they're, you're revising or, or changing the contract documents. <clears throat> so to handle this, there's specification article 110504, and it's conformity with, with and coordination of contract documents. So it provides the order to follow in case of discrepancy between the contents uh, of the contract documents. <clears throat> so if you go to that specification, it'll have a list. <clears throat> and there you can see, you know, the notice to bidders, bidders tends to be kind of a, a general statement with just uh, kind of the, uh, the big bid items listed, just kind of a notice that this project's coming up. And as you get more specific, here's the standard specifications is pretty low on the list. But then all of the, the general supplementals, the supplemental and the developmental specifications all are modifications of the standard specifications so they become uh, higher in the pecking order. The standard road plans, the project plans, pretty high on the list so that's uh, the projects, uh, they need to, those plans need to be correct because they take precedence over the, over the specs um, and some of the other uh, documents. Uh, special provisions, the proposal form tend to be pretty accurate when it uh, comes time for the letting, but if there's a, an addendum issued, that may change the, the proposal form. So the addendum is the, is the highest uh, in the, the pecking order. <clears throat> so where does the construction manual stand? Some people think it's a contract document or should be a contract document. But it's not a contract document. The purpose of the construction manual is to establish uniform policy and procedure for contract administration and inspection. It'll provide interpretations and clarifications of the specs uh, and then uh, the chapters of interest for HMA inspection include the chapter two, the contract administration, chapter three is general inspection, and chapter eight is specific to HMA paving. <clears throat> Years ago, you had all these contract documents and you had paper copies and three ring notebooks, and the inspectors had their whole cab filled with a library of, of uh, information that they carried around with them. So I, about 15 years ago, the specifications office uh, in conjunction with Iowa State uh, developed the electronic reference library, or EARL. And it, 
that came out as a, as a CD and it had all the contract documents uh, for uh, a certain letting date and that was uh, related to the uh, April and October uh, GS that were distributed. So that was a big, uh, a big savings and made a lot easier. Um, at that time, a lot of people didn't have internet access, and there weren't a, a lot of smartphones and and uh, and iPads and things out. Uh, so more recently, you have the Earl Online, and that's available on the IODOT's website. So it has all the things that are on the URL disk, but uh, um, they're available online and you can access them with your phone or, or a tablet. The one thing that's nice about the URL is that when you had paper copies, you had two documents that you had to try to put together, the, the spec book and the general specification. And you had two documents and you had to try to fit them all together. Well, the URL depending on the letting date or the, uh, the, the version of the URL, will put the appropriate revisions into the spec. So you're just dealing with one document that's valid for, for your project. <clears throat> kind of getting into the inspection duties a little bit. Just in general, it uh, involves checking, observing, documentation and reporting direct and witness contractor sampling. And that's uh, important. Um, the contractor does most of the sampling, but the inspector needs to, to uh, be assured that the timing is correct, the frequency of testing, and the procedures they use uh, are uh, according to the IMs or specifications. There is some test testing. Essentially, the only testing is, is uh, weighing of the cores in the lab, that's pretty much all the testing duties that inspectors do. Uh, some of the checks that are done, temperature. Temperature is always important for uh, asphalt paving. The ambient or air temperature, the existing pavement surface, those need to be minimums before the paving can start. Uh, of course, the mix at delivery, in some cases, it's taken from the truck, windrow, or hopper. Uh, in most cases, it's from the mixed place directly behind the paver. Uh, inspector needs to, when they're first starting up, take the first few loads until it gets stabilized, and then, uh, and then every two hours if, if the temperature is steady. So just a few of the tools of the trade. You want to take the... Uh, of the mat, the temperature, or the internal temperature, so a probe works well for that. Surface temperatures may be taken uh, with uh, a, a gun, but it's kind of, uh, uh, it needs to be calibrated to be uh, an official temperature. So measurement checks, lift, lift depth, that's the loose mix behind the paver. Uh, cross slope measurements, pavement width, before and after rolling. Uh, after rolling is, is the critical one. That's, uh, that's the width that's uh, shown on the plan and you wanna make sure that the, uh, it's consistent with the spe uh, specifications and the, and the plans. Compacted thickness from the cores and then placed mat length. Just, uh, some of the tools and taking depth checks, checking cross slopes. <clears throat> For hot box or loose samples, the number and timing of the samples is based on the estimated or intended mix quantity for the day. And then random locations are within each mix window. Uh, direct and witness the contractor sampling. Uh, document the sampling locations either with uh, station or milepost and offset or use of the locator app and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, identify and secure the sample if it's being transported by others. If it's a uh, chain of custody is, is maintained within 
the agency personnel, uh, the security may not be required. So a hot box, you use a template, typically take three cuts um, across the lane width. Four. Four now? Okay, sorry. But I use a template and remove all the material within the template. Make sure to um, replace the mix so that it, uh, it compacts to the same uh, same level as the rest. <clears throat> Sample security is covered in IM204. There's some various ways of using uh, a security tape, which uh, uh, you can tape the boxes shut. Uh, it, uh, you can tell if it's been removed. You've got uh, some barcodes to identify the sample and then some zip tie for holding bags shut. So this illustrates the use of barcodes and, uh, and the zip tie tags. Wanted to mention uh, one of the newer things, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing, and I think people are like it, is to use the barcode with the form 193, and that's the, the uh, identification of, of samples form. Complete the sample ID, form 193, scan the barcode, barcode or the QR code, or you can use the tag number to link the sample to the form 193. And previously, they'd, they'd uh, handwrite the form, fold it up, put it in the bag or what, box with the sample, and sometimes it would get destroyed or, or not be legible with uh, if there's dirt or, or asphalt on the, on the form. So now it can be uh, completed and electronically sent uh, and then uh, tied in with the, uh, with the uh, barcode to pull it up when you're, when you're uh, testing the sample. Compacted samples or cores, compute the random core locations using the core location program, lay out and mark the core locations, direct and witness the contractor sampling or coring. Uh, inspector should inspect the cores for damage, length, and document the sampling locations. And uh, another use of the locator app. Identify and secure the cores if transported by others and test or weigh the cores in the lab. So, contractor cutting the cores. And then weighing. <clears throat> A little more on the, con the inspector tools. I mentioned the locator app. That's an app that's used with a smartphone smartphone or tablet. It uses GPS coordinates versus the station or milepost and offsets to locate where the sample is taken. But it makes it easier to document locations for easy future reference. Locator app is used for a lot of different things on highways. Uh, maintenance uses it for uh, documenting sign locations and doing sign inventory, uh, guardrail, the ends of guardrails, locating them. And as far as asphalt paving, it's being used to, to uh, link the test data to the specific location. And that can go in the pavement management system and, uh, and possibly be used to uh, better know the, the life expectancy of the pavement or why there's issues with some of the, some pavement based on uh, the core results. E-ticketing is another tool. It's been used in some trials, very successful. Biggest problem with uh, load tickets is that they have to be collected for each load. And, and sometimes they get lost, sometimes they get damaged, uh, the paper tickets. And so e-ticketing is an electronic ticket versus the paper load tickets. And it, the biggest issue with 
is with safety is that you've got contract or either an inspector or contractor employee going up and getting the ticket from the, the truck driver. They're around backing trucks, uh, a lot of construction traffic, hard to see, and it's really a safety issue. And uh, with the e-ticketing, you can electronically get the ticket and it, uh, it tracks, it has a transponder, it, it uh, tracks the load from the plant to the project site. It's, uh, it's been very useful. Most of our trials uh, used a fleet management software, so it was just a small subset of the fleet managing software, which is very expensive. So that's the drawback of it, is that there's a lot of equipment costs and there's a, a licensing fee for the software. So there are vendors pursuing a standalone version and, and that'll be nice if that, if that comes to fruition. <clears throat> And just one other thing on some tools, and I'm not gonna get into it because it's being discussed later today, but the, the HMA daily field report, as well as uh, modifications to the HMA plant report and Doc Express and how those all work together, but that'll be covered later. That's all I have.